Okay, so I'm Hunter Haugen, one of the module engineers here at Puppet Labs, and we use Beaker and Beaker RSpec on a many times a day basis. So anybody here, has anybody here like poked at Beaker or tried to spin up some nodes or like looked at the source code or read their documentation or like, okay, a few people, two people, sweet. Okay, so you're here um, looking for how to use Beaker or looking for at least some way to test your puppet code without having to run it in production, right? Because so, usually that's really what people want. So uh, Beaker RSpec, or there's Beaker, which pre-existed, RSpec, Anybody used RSpec, the programming language, or the testing language before? Three, four, five people? Okay. Just getting a little feel for what you guys have pre-experienced on this. Um, I guess I can talk to about it more as we move on. So first of all, who am I? As I mentioned, I'm the mod one of the five module engineers we have here at Puppet Labs. Um, if you want, if you know the modules that start with the Puppet Labs name on the forge, probably and you want something added to it, or there's a pull request that you want merged, or there's a feature you want, usually you can ping me on IRC or something, and if it's already there, I can review it and hit the merge button. Um, I currently have like 300 and something pull requests currently open because we don't have enough time to get through all of them. So if you poke me, it's a lot faster. So I'm Hunter on IRC, usually talking in the Puppet Dev channel, Hunter on Twitter, Hunter on GitHub, Hunter at PuppetLabs.com. Or Hunter actually does work too, it's just a male alias. Because I tend to go by Hunter for everything. Um, this is mostly a demonstration talk, since I like seeing, I like learning by seeing rather than learning by hearing. So I'm gonna have a short like introductory about what these different components are, a little bit about Beaker R spec and server spec, and then actually onto real writing tests. Um, so a little bit of history. Basically, modules have been around and they need better testing than RSpec Puppet. So if you've been to, has people here, have everybody here pretty basically written a module before? Like just written a module, written code for module, okay, yeah. Puppet users group, probably a safe bet, but just wanted to check. So when you're writing modules, you're writing them on some machine, maybe it's a Linux laptop, maybe it's a Mac laptop, maybe it's a, unfortunately a Windows desktop, who knows. Um, but you need to test your code. Maybe you're writing it SSH into a machine, but you need to test your code, and so you test it, and the package gets installed, and then you're like, okay, but I didn't do the service right, so you try it again. And then this is all obviously one of the first times people will be using Puppet. So then they're like, oh, I need to uninstall the package. So they'll try and uninstall the package. Um, not all the dependencies are removed, so they try and run it again, but it's not the, quite the same state as when they first started with, and now they're like, oh, I should be using, eventually after a few months, they'll be like, oh, I should be using VMs for this instead of my development machine. So they'll start doing vagrant VMs. And, well, we'll have a short progression, so I'll just go to the next slide. So people usually end up eventually rolling VMs or having machines that they can reprovision, re-kickstart, something like that. So this is kind of the way, or they'll log into a machine and run pu puppet agent dash t dash dash no op. You know about no op, basically. But that, how real world is no op? I mean, you get the, the service not starting because the package isn't installed because it was no op and it didn't install the package. So you can get all kind of false positives, false negatives from no op. So it's not a solution either. So people usually arrive at vagrant VMs. Vagrant VMs are easy to spin up, easy to tear down. You can run Puppet on it with an, um, we had a bug in our test where it did arm RF slash because of a unescaped shell thing that tried to parse a path. And we wondered why our Postgres databases kept disappearing. I think it was in the Postgres, or no, it was in the MySQL module tests. Um, but it was on a Vagrant VM, so it didn't matter. Um, so it's good for testing modules. If you're, if, if you're not using Beaker, you're doing a Vagrant up, SCP your module in, or you're using the slash Vagrant directory, and you're doing puppet apply, and you're Vagrant destroy, Vagrant up, do it again. And then you start having some sc shell scripts around it. Everybody's shell scripts are gonna be different from that point on and you don't have any reusability and consistency. So scrap that idea. Um, another idea that people had about testing modules was, well, let's sandbox the whole thing and fake it. So Rajek or Tim Sharp wrote RSpec Puppet, which anybody here used RSpec Puppet? Maybe the few people who've written RSpec, okay. Yeah, so RSpec Puppet is a catalog compilation and assertion library 
where it essentially gets fed a manifest, it calls the puppet libraries to compile a catalog. So you can puppet 2.7, 3.4, you can make sure that your catalogs are compatible between puppet versions, and then it stops there. So you're left with a catalog. Then it takes that catalog and makes assertions. It should have this user, should have this file. The file template content should be this. The exec should have this parameter. The server package, or the uh, Postgres package name should be this. So you make assertions about your catalog. And this helped some. It helped especially with figuring out, do my puppet catalogs compile at all? Are there syntax errors? Are there templates with missing paths? Are there variables that don't exist in my template that I thought they were, did, but then they were typos, so they ended up being nil? Um, our spec puppet does have a niche there. It's quick in the range of, like, if it's taking over a minute, you've probably written a lot of tests. Um, and it's good for checking conditional logic and your templates and a little bit of verification on your class resources. So like if I pass enable true or if I pass enable false, I want it to install the package, start the service, have these dependency orders. Or if I want to uninstall it, then I uninstall the package, stop the service or the right order, except the other way around. So it's good for some things. But what does it not do? You don't know if your module works. Did the exec run? Is the package actually the right name that Debian expects versus Red Hat? Um, does the config file parse? I've written a lot of um, our HA proxy module had a bug in it where it would flip all the orders backwards if you had more than one load balancer. So it would actually be like, instead of the load balancer name and its directives, they would be the other way around. And that could pass an RSpec puppet, but it didn't work on a system. Um, if you were recently looking around, you might have seen RSpec system. This will be just a brief overview because it doesn't really play in much anymore. But there was this thing called RSpec system, which Ken Barber, one of our PuppetDB engineers, created specifically for testing his PuppetDB module. It was kind of a spin off of Beaker. Actually, it was a spin off of the thing that Beaker came from that Alice has made it into awesomeness now. Um, the older, what do we call it? Test harness, puppet test harness or something. It was, yeah, it, it, SysTest. It was a little bit, it was, well, a lot more kludgy and didn't really work for modules and like only worked on our network with our Jenkins and with our specific stuff. So we've worked pretty hard to make it more modular so that you, so that other companies can also take it, so you can take it home. But anyway, so our spec system arose out of that, had some cool ideas, but he was working on PuppetDB, didn't have the time to maintain it. So we picked up our spec system integrated his ideas with Beaker, and voila, we have Beaker RSpec. So Beaker RSpec um, was essentially created by Alice uh, when she picked up the Beaker project and revamped it to be able to actually reusably test modules. Reusably test one module and all of its individual components. You take a bunch of modules, put them together. You can take a bunch of modules on one node, a bunch of modules on another node, and make a web DB load balancer test. You can test all of this in a sandbox environment with real machines. So it's good for CI and good for, I don't have it here, but actually, sorry, this is, this is old. It, the docs are, actually exist now. Um, it's good for knowing if your modules work. It's bad for speed. Because, you know, when you puppet a machine for the first time, it can take five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, two hours, sometimes. Um, and Beaker RSpec can't make Puppet go any faster. So we try and internally, just, I don't have this in my slides, but internally what we try and do is balance a little bit of RSpec Puppet with a little bit of Beaker RSpec for speed and not quite the right feedback versus slow, but a bit more concrete feedback and try and uh, balance those back and forth. So what is Beaker RSpec and what do you do with it? Um, as Alice pointed out, we kind of have a little bit of duplicate information. There's the wiki on GitHub. Oops for how to write a beaker test for a module. And it's got some boilerplate information, some guides, copy pasteable stuff, some of the commands. I'm gonna go through all this as part of this presentation, so I'm not gonna spend time in the docs. There are also examples. All of our supported modules um, were, were able to be launched because of beaker RSpec, because we felt confident enough in our ability to qualify and test any feedback that we got from them. 
uh, because of Beaker RSpec. So all of our supported modules, I just gave five examples here, have Beaker tests in the GitHub repository. And there's plenty others besides the supported ones that have them. And there's even community modules that have them. So there are examples out there. And like I said, I like learning with my hands. So in case you do too. How do you use Beaker RSpec? Um, we tried to be a little bit more lightweight than some of the Beaker stuff, so to try and help people get into it, it is also probably slightly a little less flexible than Beaker itself from that, but we're also working to make that um, a reality. But essentially, if you have easy mode, Vagrant, or if you want to get a little bit more down into the nuts and bolts, EC2, something else like that, GCE, it works with that. So you have Vagrant VirtualBox, which is what my demo will be showing. Uh, clone a module repository, CD into it, and then we use gem bundler and a rate and an RSpec command. So then you just run RSpec on the spec acceptance directory in the module, and it runs all of your tests. And then, as I mentioned, it's a little bit slow. It, in Vagrant, it's got to wait. It's got to clone the VM, boot the VM, and by that time, you're about two minutes, two and a half minutes in, and then SCP the module over and start running tests. So about two minutes to two and a half minutes, depending on your machine, you can um, start seeing the test output. Demo time. So, my SSH connection died again. I have Oh, lovely. I have the Puppet Labs NTP module cloned here. My Puppet Labs NTP, my just cloned off of there. It's the master branch, no changes. So we have this spec acceptance directory. It's got some specs in there for managing the service, making sure the package can install correctly, uh, NTP config checks the configuration stuff. NTP parameters is probably where most of it is. That's where we say, I mean, we've kind of done the boilerplate for the module. Now NTP parameters runs tests for every single parameter that NTP accepts and says, can I pass in servers? Can I pass in restrict? Can I pass in jitter or uh, resolution or what's that stuff called? Panic, tinker. Like it, it has a test for every single parameter. So bundle, exec, rspec. Our spec commands just expects you to pass it a test name. So spec acceptance, I could run just NTP parameters if I wanted, or I can run all of them this way. By default, it will run whichever node set is called default, which is in this case a CentOS 6 machine. I'll show you some other stuff to do in a second. We're not going to wait for this whole thing to go through. Um, might take. I don't have the scroll back. I think it takes eight minutes or something, so I'm going to kill it partway through um, and keep talking while it's spinning up until we see test running. But essentially what it's going to do is wait for the machine to boot, SSH into it, do the kind of the stuff Alex, uh, Alice said, like check NTP date, and then start applying manifests, which I will get to in the writing tests part. You can apply arbitrary manifests, any manifest you want for any classes you want, any combinations. If you have roles and profiles, you can use Beaker RSpec to test your roles and profiles. If you just want to test your uh, custom fact, you can do that too. It's not puppet specific either, though Beaker is less puppet specific. Beaker can test anything puppet or not. Like if you have your own, you can just test, you could test with Chef even, um, just as an example to show how how kind-hearted we are in providing such a good tool to the community. No. Um, but so Beaker RSpec is kind of puppet-oriented. If there are failures, what do you do about that? So lots of times, like the RMRF slash, it started complaining about the database being missing or the command not being found. I'm like, what's wrong with path? Why can't I find the database? Did the create database not work? But the, really the issue was when you try and log into it, like you realize there's nothing else there. Um, so debugging things isn't always as apparent as what the log output says. So the log output can say, um, my database table doesn't exist. Well, really, the file system doesn't exist. So don't, trust, don't always trust the logs. So if we get good log metrics from better logging, they still won't reveal the whole story. So 
you have to do things like don't destroy the machines once you're done with them. Because if the, or you can do only destroy them on pass. So if there's failures, keep them up. So I can SSH into them, see why did that really fail? Why did that really happen? So I can manually run Puppet on it. All the manifests are stored in slash temp. They're, gen they're stuck in slash temp so that you can reapply them later to see failures. So you can set beaker destroy no, so don't destroy it at the beginning or at the end. And you can run the test over and over by saying don't destroy at the beginning. And then you can run on other operating systems by giving it a node set or just set technically as a short name. Let's see if we have test output. It's still installing Puppet. So the machines don't come with Puppet installed on it. So, so that we can install PE or FOSS or of any given version. And so we have to wait for that. That's another slow part. So my two demos are now colliding because I'm supposed to run it on Ubuntu. I could run, essentially I'd run the exact same command with beaker set equals Ubuntu 12.04 something bundle exec our spec spec acceptance. So you just prefix it with that shell variable or export the shell, shell variable and it goes. Um, I'll show that in a minute. Beaker does multi node two. This graphic is not related to what I'm talking about, but Beaker does multi node stuff and we don't really do it internally. We just take a node, we run it on there, and then are happy. One node is usually enough. Now, some of the superpowers it gets. There is this thing called server spec. So, Anybody heard of server spec? Heard of, like even just heard of? One person, two people, okay. So server spec is a, I'll just go to it. Server spec is essentially a way to unit test your servers. So you have servers out there, like your live actual servers, development servers, production servers, whatever. Server spec is a way where you give it at login credentials and it logs into your machines and checks the running processes, checks the contents of files, checks the install that certain packages are present or absent. It's kind of like Puppet if you translated, in, translated it into R spec. So it has some resource types like package. Where's package? Now let's do service. That's one that's more interesting. So you can say, Describe service and TBD. It should be enabled, or it should be running, or should be enabled with, log, with run level three, or should be running under supervisor if you have some special init system. Or user should exist, should belong to group Apache, should have UID zero. It doesn't do anything to your machine, so it doesn't replace Puppet. It just verifies. So it kind of duplicates part of Puppet, because Puppet, when it runs, verifies all this information. So server spec was for people who had servers and wanted to verify that. Turns out, if you use Puppet to check Puppet, that's kind of defeating the purpose. So we use server spec to inspect what Puppet did to make sure it was right. Because if there's a bug in one or a bug in the other, they, they'll usually not have the same bug at the same time. So that's why R specs tests are written in Cucumber, and Cucumber's tests are written in R spec, because the two testing frameworks can test each other. Um, so we use server spec as it's an R spec extension for system, mon system inspection to give R spec puppet superpowers. And finally, on to writing tests with 30 minutes to go. Let's check on our tests running again. Oh, and it finished in one minute and 21 seconds. So the whole spin up probably took three minutes, four minutes to install Puppet, and the tests themselves took one minute, 21 seconds. 55 tests. Um, hey, and I have scroll back now. So let's look at what scroll back I get. Good, my SSH didn't die. Um, so any green line means there's a test. Any lines before the green lines means that's the running of the test. So here I'm grepping for server prefer server with some digit prefer in etsy ntp.com. So I had a parameter I passed in, and I expected that line to be existing in the config so I can test that stuff. Server D prefer, server C, server B, server A. Um, I'm checking that Puppet applies cleanly, making sure it doesn't have resource failures or something. That's often what we'll find is 
So you have your modules, and you'll run Puppet, and by the end, all the stuff is scrolled past, and you're like, oh, it worked. But if you scroll up a few pages, you see some red or some yellow, and you're like, oh, actually something's failed. Um, so what this does is it looks at the exit code to make sure, did, were there any resource changes? Were there any resource failures? Were there any compilation, compilation or parsing failures? And it can tell you about those individual things. So here it's checking service NTB status, it gets the status, checks the return code of that, and it says the service should be running. It checks the log level. This is all server spec running these commands, and so it'll run check config dash dash list on Red Hat systems, but it can run something else entirely on Solaris. It'll run SVC, uh, SVC something, I forget, I'm rusty on Solaris. So that's server spec actually picking out those commands. I just said service NTPD should be enabled. Easy test. For the sake of discussion, I'll do bigger set equals Ubuntu server 12.04. I think that was how it is. So something like that, and I can now run, so I just ran on Red Hat 6, now I can run it on Ubuntu 12.04. Tried same thing on different operating systems. It runs the exact same tests, so it runs the same puppet manifests on any server you give it. You can conditionalize them, but we try not to because our puppet module should work on anything. Um, so we run the same tests on Ubuntu 10, 12, Red Hat 6, Red Hat 5, Solaris 11, if it's possible. Um, we try and run the same tests on all the machines so we know that the functionality exists on all of them. NTP will pass on AIX 5, 6, and 7, which is pretty cool. But we'll not get into that. Oh. Back to presentation. Okay, so shortly I'm going to write code live. And I didn't practice that or this earlier, but I do this for a living, so maybe it'll work. Um, so there are a few pieces which it's easier to copy paste than to write. Namely, the gem file, since it's basically like, make sure the beaker gem is here, make sure the beaker rspec gem is here, make sure the server spec gem is here. So my Mac, or if I'm running it on a Linux machine or whatever, has to have those gems installed to run the test suite. So I copy the gem file from an existing module, usually Apache or whatever. I copy the acceptance spec helper from an existing module and edit this so that I can install the dependencies on the nodes. I'll show you this in a second. And then I just copy all my node sets because usually I want to run, have all my node sets available and all the vagrant boxes available. So let's say I want to make my own NTP module. And manifests. So I'm going to make my Hunter NTP module and vim manifests init.pp, and it's going to have class NTP and package. I'm only going to test on Red Hat. We want this to be running and enable true. And that's a perfectly good NTP module right there. No parameters or anything, um, but it's good enough to test. So now a few things, let me bump the font size up a tiny bit. A few things we might want to test on this is, well, uh, spin up a machine and make sure that I can apply the class with no, with exit code either zero or two. Um, anybody know what puppet exit code 2 means? With detailed exit codes, I should say. I know Finch does. He's our developer. Okay, so puppet has these different detailed exit codes. They're actually binary codes. So by default, it just exits 0. But you can pass dash dash detailed exit codes, and it will exit 0 for no changes, 1 for parse failures or compilation failures, 2 for resource changes, 
And then remember this is binary math, so it goes 0, 1, 2, 4, or 8. Yeah. Wait, there's no 8. So 2 for resource ch changes and 4 for resource failures. And then it's binary math, so if you have a 6, that means it's 2 plus 4, which means there were resource changes and resource failures. And so we use this to tell what's going on. So maybe the package installed, so that was a resource change, but then the service failed to start, so that was a resource failure, and I'd get an exit code of 6, which is bad. So in Beaker, we have this, I'm going to skip that for a second. We have this ability to check assertions on puppet runs, like we want to make sure that we want to catch all failures. So if we catch failures, that means if any failures happen, we expect either a zero or two. So changes are okay, no changes are okay, but failures are bad. We can catch changes, meaning watch it, and if there's any changes, catch those and raise an error, a test failure. Like we want it to always have no changes. So you know Puppet, if you know the word, um, idempotent or idempotent, meaning I run it once and it does my stuff. I run it again and it does nothing because it already did it once, right? You want to run Puppet, if you run it twice in a row, it should do all the stuff the first time and not the second time. This is good Puppet practice, good pre Puppet hygiene, if this is sounding familiar. So usually what we do in our modules is we run catch failures. So go ahead Puppet, do whatever you want to the machine as long as you don't fail. Then we run it again with catch changes, which is go ahead Puppet and run and I expect you to do nothing on the machine. If it does something, that's a failure because our, like if we're changing our templates back and forth and back and forth, or we have a notify message that prints every single time Puppet runs, that's failures on our modules because it's, it creates line noise and it makes it harder to see when machines are actually being changed in production or development or different things like that. And then you can also do the inverse. So like if I pass this bad parameter in, I expect failures to happen. If I pass restrict server, 209,000 or whatever, some non-valid IP address, I expect that, that to raise an error and I can check that the standard out has a correct error and everything. So we have a few abilities that we can do. Here's our test DSL. So I know you guys are all waiting for an example and waiting for me to run stuff. So uh, our, we're basically saying we're describing our, our NTP class. We apply it idempotently, meaning twice in a row with no changes a second time. So our, our manifest is just this, class NTP. Just include the class, move on with life. Um, you can write as complicated or simple manifest there as you want. So if you want to define your roles with 25 parameters and then iterate on those depending on what your current setups are, you can do that also. So we apply it once with catch failures, apply it again with catch changes. So no failures and then second with no changes. And then we just, we're using server spec to say that etsy.ntp.com should have tinker panic zero, which is good for VMs because when they suspend and they come back and their clocks are skewed, they don't panic, kernel panic. Uh, then we say service NTP should be running and should be enabled. This is legitimate test. Make sure your module works. Unfortunately, I can't copy paste this because it's an image. to the gist. Not that one. Sorry, I didn't think about this. Let's see, NTP. Nope, nope, nope. What did I want? Tinker panic. I want my own. Yeah, this one. so I don't have to type this. So I have my class. So let's edit spec acceptance. All spec files will go in the, for Beaker, our spec go in spec acceptance directory. It's partially convention. It may even be enforced by the code, but I've never tried putting them anywhere else in a long time. So I don't know if it might break or whatever. So we're just gonna do it NTP spec.rb. If you know RSpec, it must end with underscore spec.rb, otherwise it's invisible to RSpec. And done. So we have our class, come on, 
Oh, I set paste, didn't I? We have our class and our tests for that class. Usually your tests will be much longer because Puppet DSL is pretty expressive and so if you take in so a few parameters and you have a few templates, your tests to pass in all those template, all those parameters and evaluate the returns will be a little bit longer, but you will also have the surety of mind knowing that your code works. Any questions so far about the test before I actually try and run it? Clarifications on server spec or what kind of modules? Yep, I haven't copied the files yet. That's just some CPing. Actually, I do have to do the one edit, though. So that might be interesting. If I already have Apache, which I don't. If you've ever not seen the hub command, H-U-B, it's basically a thing for git where you can run git clone something slash repo name and it assumes that you mean GitHub. So it saves some typing. So cp dot dot slash puppet labs apache spec. Now let's do the gem file. Don't really have to edit that. Let's do the spec acceptance node sets recursively to spec acceptance, which just has a bunch of node sets in it, and then cp spec acceptance spec acceptance helper. So this is the one other file that we needed. And this file we usually edit. This is also the file where you can put any arbitrary things in. So if you want to drop a, a public key for SSH credentials or install any other packages or add repositories, you can do that in this file. I'm going to change this. Beaker provision. Okay, so the reason I copy this is probably self-evident, but essentially this is going to call either install PE or install Puppet, depending on if I want to run FOSS tests or PE tests. We run the same module with the same test through both systems, trying to be as uniform as possible without playing special cases for something that doesn't work in one place. We have this unsupported platforms thing that we can call to, so NTP, is supported on AIX, I know, so I could remove that, for example. I'm not going to use it in this presentation, but. And then some boilerplate stuff, and then the stuff where we care about the, the dependencies. What dependencies does NTP have? We don't have any dependencies. I just wrote this module. I should know what it has. So we can just delete all this stuff. If you want examples of how to install dependencies, that's the thing I just deleted. You can see our modules on GitHub, or I can talk about it after. And this module is called NTP. That's all the editing I do. Usually I delete or update the dependencies and edit the name of the module, and that's all I have to do. That is also that file is also in the documentation on the wiki for copy paste ability. So now I have my gem file, which says I need beaker, beaker spec, and server spec. I have my init.pp, which is my super simple module, my node sets for a bunch of different operating systems, and my one spec that says the package should be enabled or installed and the server should be enabled and running. Last thing, bundle install and bundle exec rake, no, not rake. R spec, spec acceptance. And I'll do it with a beaker set equals what operating system? How about Debian? Everybody likes Debian 7.3. Actually, not everybody likes Debian, unfortunately, including me. Any questions before I hit go about what I've done in the past like 30 seconds? It's mostly copy paste. I wrote the test, I didn't write the test by hand because it was easier to copy paste that. Let's see if I actually did it right since I haven't run those tests yet. 
and a bundle install. So anyway, while this is running, because it's going to also have to boot the VM, hopefully it doesn't download it. Oh, look, a backtrace. Live demos for the win. OK, the host file doesn't exist. I specified an invalid host file. Yes, you are correct. It was, if we read the backtrace, nibs fast with the eyes, the file.yaml.yaml does not exist. It thought, because I had .yaml as part of the name. Thank you. So it more or less looks like the ones that I just showed you for the NTP one. It will hopefully be much shorter, and I'll leave it up on screen. So um, that's essentially how we test modules here. I can show you our Jenkins stuff in a little bit. I'll try and keep this on screen. Actually, why not? Jenkins. So our Jenkins stuff, there's a few modules in it right now, our supported modules. Um, we kind of line it up on font size. Too big. We kind of line it up on um, one module per line. So this is Java KS. This is MySQL. This is NTP. So you can see VCS repo. I don't know. I mean, one of our team members is taking care of that. You know Jenkins and, it, and why it could be failing for random reasons. So it, that's, that module is all red. I could go in and inspect that. Apt system test. This is the system tests are like it runs two FOSS Debian and it runs a FOSS Red, Red Hat, FOSS Debian, PE Red Hat, PE Debian as like a four node simple thing. Runs Puppet Lint, Puppet RSpec, packages it up, uploads it, uploads it to a fake forge or package repository thing, and then passes that off to Beaker. So simple beaker tests here, and then we have extended beaker tests over here. For example, our NTP module. It's running against scientific Linux, Ubuntu, Solaris, Windows. We are running NTP tests against Windows. The test is that it should fail. It, sh it should, literally it says it should fail with this error message and saying, hey, this module doesn't work on Windows. Um, so the tests are green. Uh, Red Hat 5, we don't have Red Hat 4, Oracle Enterprise Linux 6. So this is our Jenkins backend that is backed by Beaker. And if you wanted to see, as you were asking about the log output from that, you'd visit one of these nodes and you could see their previous runs and their log output. Since they're green, they're not very interesting. But let's see, console output. So here is not very interesting. Let's see if we have tests yet. Nope, still waiting for the VM to boot. Or to download even. Perhaps I don't have it downloaded yet. Should have stuck with the default. Um, one other thing, off t slightly unrelated, but we also have this thing called the vPooler, which uh, when Alice said vCloud and vSphere, they're kind of the same thing in VMware terms, but we have this thing we call vCloud, which is essentially it's a service that talks to vSphere that keeps pools of VMs of various operating systems up and running. This is all open source also. I'll show you that in a second. So we have, it, it basically is a REST API JSON speaking checkout point for VMs. So it keeps a pool of, say, 10 Fedora 20 boxes, 5 OpenSUSE 11 boxes, 20 CentOS 5 boxes, both 32-bit and 64-bit. They're up and running hot, ready to be checked out like that. They're already booted. You don't have to wait for that. They already have our Yum repository added or our app repository added, um, all of those sorts of things. And you can, and we point Beaker at this because then we don't have to wait for Beaker to spin up. Oh, here we go. Now we're running update. So this is a VM running. I'm running out of time for questions. If you want to see his VMware pooler thing, it's 
Scott Schneider or S. Schneid on GitHub slash VM Pooler. In case, in case you're looking for a little bit more speed up and not want to do Docker. So, questions about the tests? Oh, look, Tinker Panic Zero failed because it's probably not in the config by default. And unable to locate package NTPD. Probably because it's named NTP. My bad. So this is what it looks like when you get failures. The information apparent here, like, oh, why, did it, why doesn't the config contain Tinker Panic Zero? And so you can scroll up and see some of the information more about what it was actually able to f not able to find or SSH to the box and look at the config and see what's actually in it. Um, so that's why we keep the VMs up and running. So questions, since I only have a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, it, question was: Is there any way to automate porting of B, of RSpec Puppet to Beaker RSpec? There's no automated way, but I definitely used my Puppet RSpec tests when I wrote my Beaker RSpec. I just took the manifest and the parameters that I was testing in RSpec Puppet and the template output that I expect to have, and I just wrote almost exactly the same thing in my Beaker RSpec. So I did. It was a manual process, but it definitely helped speed up the development of tests because I didn't have to think about, okay, what are all the states I could pass into this parameter? What are the negative tests? What are the positive tests? What, what's the name of the package on the operating system? NTP, not NTPD, those kinds of things. So, yeah. Do you have some puppet R, or RSpec puppet tests already? Okay, so now, if you're using Beaker and you're using RSpec Puppet, when do you add tests to one, the other, or both? I would say, so remember, every test you add to Beaker RSpec, it's already a little bit slow, so do you want, really want to add it, make it slower? So if I'm testing lots of negative tests, like if I pass in uh, negative integers, or usually the test that will cause it to fail, Compilation failures, I don't want to bother Beaker with because it's got to take the whole compilation time again. So I don't usually do that. So any failure messages, negative tests for parameters, validation, all that sort of stuff, I'll leave that to RSpec Puppet. Any system tests where I have to depend on the parsing of a config file or the installation of a package with dependencies and the enabling and checking of a service, that kind of thing I do to Beaker. Any, any template conditional logic or puppet conditional logic, I'll do an RSpec puppet. And I might even do that in Beaker RSpec if I feel like I could mess it up. So, yeah. Uh, good question, though. Um, any further comments on that or any other questions I guess I could open up? Any other questions at all? Oh, thanks. <laughs>